I'd like to thank the lovely ladies of um, Midwives First for the opportunity to be here today and share with you some of our work. It's um, actually a real privilege to be in the same room with um, <coughs> midwives who share my um, passionate commitment to the well-being of mothers and babies. Um, all of us here have um, a bone deep um, understanding of the significance of the developmental origins of disease and how absolutely important it is to get early life care right. Some of what I want to share with you today I um, understand can be quite disturbing to some of our colleagues as committed as they are to our shared values. And this is because post-birth care at this time is actually poised on the cusp of paradigm shift. So right across the four critical domains of breastfeeding, cry, fuss, sleep and mood problems, there's tremendous change about to occur. And uh, at a time of paradigm shift when we're just teetering on that cusp of mm, flipping into the new paradigm, enormous tensions do emerge um, between the old familiar models of how um, we've understood each of these domains and the new that's emergent out of cutting edge research. So you'll see that I've given you a handout that details um, the publications um, from various of my teams over the last um, 12 years or so. Um, and I just mentioned that um, each of those references is actually available um, on my personal website in PDF form or sometimes in a PDF of the final draft depending on the copyright um, regulations. So that's at pamelaDouglas.com.au uh, and I do invite you to um, actually go in and perhaps um, become familiar with, with some of um, these publications, um, either meta-narrative syntheses or systematic reviews, because we do live in an era where evidence-based is used as, as a marketing tool and, uh, and may simply refer to one or two very methodologically weak studies. Um, when we're creating a new paradigm, first we have to get the theoretical frames right. And you'll see that what we're calling community-based um, neuroprotective developmental care, also known as, as the POSSUMS programs, um, has very strong theoretical foundations. And you'll also see in there um, a number of preliminary evaluations, but by virtue of being preliminary, um, they're methodologically weak and there's still a long way to go on this road of, of um, evaluating the um, neuroprotective developmental care programs that we're offering. You, you would be familiar, of course, with the neuroprotective family-centred developmental care that's offered in our neonatal intensive care context. Um, building on that pioneering work by Heide Lees Owls. And uh, you'll see that um, we've adapted that term to apply um, once babies come home into the community. Um, Owls work, um, as again you'd be um, uh, very aware, um, aims to optimise synaptic connections, uh, uh, promote healthy development and protect against disabilities in premies. And we're translating that fundamental concept into the community-based care um, we offer across the domains of breastfeeding, cry, fuss, problems, sleep, and maternal mood in the community. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, by the way, with, with questions. Um, um, if, if anything I say needs clarification, just, just break in. So the NDC lens actually is integrative and interdisciplinary. So it integrate, integrates the complex and heterogeneous literatures 
across medical science, neuroscience, lactation science, sleep science, um, integrates it with the psychologies of attachment and third wave behaviourism and then evolutionary medicine and cross-cultural studies. Uh, so I'd also like to mention um, right up front that those of you who are interested in gaining a more in-depth understanding of our work, um, we're, we're running certification days. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my colleague Debbie Spink is um, uh, organising these for us in the um, Redlands district, available free for those who work in Redlands, um, in partnership with the Brisbane South Primary Health Network. If you're not working in Redlands, then there is a, a fee to participate, but you'd be, be welcome. And, uh, and also, we're about to launch our um, accreditation um, program uh, for those who are really interested in being identified on our website as an NDC accredited practitioner and part of um, the Neuroprotective Developmental Care Network. Um, alongside this, um, we're also on the cusp of launching our PIPS program, so um, a program for integrated perinatal peer support. And Debbie may mention that in greater detail later today. So in this talk, I'm going to offer you um, misconceptions uh, concerning newborn behaviour and parental anxiety in the same spirit, actually, that I share uh, perspectives with, with parents in my consultations. So what I say to parents goes something like this. So you know, having been a parent for X weeks or months, just how much conflicting care there is out there. Parents nod vigorously and sometimes really become quite teary because this is a terrible problem, as you know. Um, I say, look, I, I might have the belief, I might argue, and, and, and I do, that in 20 years' time, um, most people will be doing something really close to what we're doing because this is where all the evidence is taking us. But that actually doesn't help you today. I'm just going to offer you ideas. You're the expert on your own baby. So some of what I offer you might seem worth trying out, worth experimenting with, and some of what I offer you, you might decide is not appropriate in your particular context. Um, so similarly, offering to you today um, ideas, perspectives out of um, the NDC work. You, um, I, I, I know, practice in a values-directed um, way and you'll decide um, what's worth experimenting with and what may not be um, something that you want to practice integrating into your own um, consultations with clients. So I'd like to start by sharing with you three concepts, three key concepts to neuroprotective developmental care. These arise out of um, our peer-reviewed and, and published work around the um, neurobiological model of unsettled infant behaviour. That came out in 2013. And the um, first concept is that of the dial on the sympathetic nervous system. And this concept is really helpful when we're supporting parents to understand um, differently why their baby might be unsettled. So, of course, we live in, in a world where um, many infant communications are inappropriately medicalised. And being able to talk about the dial on the sympathetic nervous system helps us explain to these families why the baby's crying is not, not due to reflux or gourd or oral ties um, or allergy in most cases. Um, so let me explain to you um, how 
um, this would work in, in my consultations. Um, I'd start by um, checking out how much parents sort of grasp the concept of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, would you like me to unpack that a bit? So then I'll talk about the fight or flight response in, in adults. I feel that if I'm dialing up, if my sympathetic nervous system is dialing up, you know, my heart rate increases, I might become a little bit hot and flushed, my blood pressure's rising, I might get anxious feelings in my tummy. Um, for our little ones, and I might look at that bubby um, in the parent's arms and say, you know, right now, um, your little one is, is actually just lying there drowsily looking at you at times. She's really dialed down. The dial on her sympathetic nervous system is dialed right down. But probably by the end of our time together in this boring old low sensory room, she'll have started to dial up. So when she's starting to grizzle, starting to fuss, the, the dial on her sympathetic nervous system is being turned up. If she was screaming, then the dial is turned up on full bore. And um, I then might move into saying how it's often not well understood how um, the sympathetic nervous system relates to the gut in, in our society. Because when the sympathetic nervous system is dialing up, that also activates the gut. So parents will often say, my little one um, you know, began to groan and rise and grunt in the night. And then next thing I know, there was a puke or passing of wind or um, a burp. And it was the gut pain, the wind, that's waking my baby. Um, you know, what can I do to deal with this gut pain or wind problem? So I invite parents, I don't necessarily directly contradict it head on, but I just say, look, can I share with you what, what happens within my brain? When I hear this, I have a particular way of making sense of it. Can I share it with you? And you might just experiment with this and, and see if it makes sense to you. And, um, and so then I'll say, when our little people are rousing out of sleep, the sympathetic nervous system is starting to dial up. But that activates the gut. And so as they're rousing up out of sleep, then the gut gets active. Then you have a gut event. So the baby's not being woken in the night because of the gut, but because the baby's waking, then there's a gut event. And, uh, and often, you know, in various permutations, depending on what the issue is, this kind of explanation can be really helpful to parents as we start to work with making sense of their baby's cues in a way that doesn't inappropriately medicalise. So the next concept is something that's, of course, um, very familiar to you, the concept of cued care. Um, the Oxford um, Dictionary uh, defines a cue as a signal um, <coughs> for action. So in the NDC work, we define cued care of our infants as a pattern of sensibly responding to um, that baby over time with the aim of keeping the baby as dialed down as sensibly possible because we know from all the latest neuroscience and attachment literatures that this kind of cued care optimises our baby's developmental outcomes. So in any discussion of cued care, we acknowledge that it's not always possible to respond to your baby. It's not always possible to have your baby dialed down in response to what you're offering. But we're after a pattern of sensible responsiveness over time. We'll talk with parents about how we try to get in as early as we can before that sympathetic nervous system is dialed up so high that it's triggering a cascade of ongoing sympathetic nervous system activity, bringing that baby into a crying loop or what you might refer to as a bout of 
prolonged and inconsolable crying. We want to get in as early as possible because, in fact, um, again, as you'd be aware, in the first 16 weeks, our little ones um, are particularly neurologically sensitive and a conditioned dialing up of the sympathetic nervous system is very easy um, to occur and, and we want to try to get in as early as we can um, um, to prevent that. So the, 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 the next concept then is, is the concept of the getting in sync and um, the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary would define in sync as a state where two or more people um, match one another and work together um, in a way that's, that's harmonious and proper. So um, cued care, you would be familiar with this as responsive care perhaps or effective synchrony. Um, in the neurobiological model of unsettled um, infant behaviour, we refer to it as neurohormonal synchrony. Um, getting in sync is like riding a bicycle, isn't it? <clears throat> because as parents, we're very rarely um, at that midpoint that's stable. We're generally wobbling on either side adjusting constantly, taking into account feedback. So parents learn to get in sync with their newborn through experimentation as they try to make sense of what their baby's communicating. But this only works if you're still on the bike. And uh, our job as um, health professionals is to help parents stay on the bike or to affect a repair if they've come off the bike. Being off the bike is disempowering and depressing. No matter what the parent tries to do, they don't seem to be able to dial the little person down. Um, and, uh, and, and this is where we've run into serious problems in post-birth care as a society because um, much of what we offer as health professionals um, actually um, has not um, uh, been able to support families as they stay on the bike and aim to keep that little person dialed down as much as they can. So um, when parents and babies have this pattern over time of neurohormonal synchrony then of course enjoyment flourishes and this is why um, our uh, guiding phrase at Possums is growing joy in early life. So being out of sync often results from communication confusions between parents and babies, which are health professional induced. Um, a iatrogenic problem is, is defined as a, a problem that's induced by the means of treating the problem and then ascribed to the continuing natural development of the problem that's being treated. Um, does that make sense to you? So I'd like to um, offer you the case of, of Jane and Simon uh, and you'll see that um, Jane's um, anxiety and postnatal depression are, one could argue, very strongly iatrogenic. So um, two-week-old Simon is having difficulty latching at the breast and uh, when he does come on he'll feed for a little while and then starts to fuss and pull off and back arch and cry. <coughs> then he might come back on for a little while and, and the pattern's repeated. So that the breastfeeding um, is quite distressing both for Jane and for Simon. So um, by week three, um, Simon has been diagnosed with um, uh, tongue tie and upper lip tie. There's no uh, sign of a classic tongue tie. Um, he's also been diagnosed with aerophagia-induced reflux. So Jane's um, advice to have laser treatment under the tongue and upper lip, um, but she's also advised 
that she needs to start regular burping of Simon through the feeds because of all the air that he's swallowing due to his um, oral connective tissue tightnesses, restrictions. So as Jane um, now proceeds with the breast feeds, which still um, um, involve a lot of fussing as uh, Simon comes onto the breast, she also takes him off after five or ten minutes to do some vigorous burping and to hold him upright. Uh, Simon um, screams, cries a lot when this happens and actually is harder to get back onto the breast afterwards. Um, because um, of all of this um, uh, unsettled behaviour, um, Jane's advice to stay in the house and to um, make sure that Simon's getting enough sleep by engaging some sleep routines and teaching him to self-settle. Um, she's also advised um, um, that she should start spacing out the feeds, um, that she's been overfeeding him in her desperate attempts to make sure that he's getting milk. Um, so come three to four weeks, Jane's taken Simon to have the um, laser treatments and has engaged the wound stretching three to four times a day. Um, she's also seeing the chiropractor who's given her multiple um, uh, massage exercises for um, muscle tightment, tightness that's been diagnosed around the mouth. Um, and um, actually Simon is screaming for perhaps a total of three or four hours each day. Um, around this time she's also told that he's failing to gain weight adequately. Um, the paediatrician diagnoses reflux and it is recommended that she takes, um, that she, she, she uses a proton pump inhibitor um, with Simon. Um, come week five, Jane is diagnosed with postnatal depression. Is this a scenario that's familiar to you? Did you have thoughts about this? Anyone want to offer, offer a reflection? This is, this is very common, um, heartbreakingly common. And I, um, I'm afraid I have to name this as um, case of iatrogenic um, anxiety and postnatal depression. Now some folks will say, well Jane's an underlying uh, sort of vulnerable personality and that she's an anxious type of person. But that makes me cross because that kind of framing perpetuates the kind of mother blaming that characterised the 20th century and should not be a part of the care we're offering families in the 21st century. That baby, at the very outset, has had positional instability at the breast. That baby has not been able to fit into his mum's body as they breastfeed in a way that ensures positional stability and as a result um, was unable to latch on easily, was crying and fussing and then uh, typically develops a conditioned dialing up at the breast. Um, but instead of managing the, the, the underlying um, problems, Jane was given um, a range of advice about how to interpret her infant's behaviour that um, actually caused her to fall completely off the bike. So iatrogenic communication confusion is the critical problem in post-birth care in our society. So I know you'd all completely agree with me that mothers and babies are hardwired to breastfeed and to enjoy it, but environmental and socio-cultural factors, of course, turn on or turn off those um, hardwired reflexes. So in the material I've given you in table one, you'll see I've laid out a list of, of um, 
baby cues in breastfeeding that are typically misinterpreted in our society and generally through a medicalised lens. Most significantly, the back arching at the breast, the pulling off the breast, the difficulty coming onto the breast and the conditioned dialing up at the breast are medicalised as either reflux, um, reflux gourd, um, oral ties in the absence of a classic tongue tie, um, allergies, which is not to say there isn't the occasional newborn with an allergy, but we seriously overdiagnose allergies in our um, young babies. Um, sometimes a lactose intolerance can be used um, as a diagnosis in this context too. So the problems of fit and hold are a critical blind spot in breastfeeding support, but this has ramifications right across our other um, domains of cry fuss problems, sleep problems, and maternal and parental mood challenges. To date, the research tells us that current approaches to fit and hold, and it's, it's actually quite um, painful, I think, for us to hear this, but current approaches to fit and hold, including the physiological um, initiation of breastfeeding or the mammalian approaches, actually are not improving breastfeeding outcomes. As, as uh, foundational as the mammalian approaches are, um, parents are needing more in order to successfully breastfeed. In fact, we know that um, many of our clinical breastfeeding support professionals are still using an approach to fit and hold, um, in particular the shaping of the breast and the hand on the cross cradle hold, the hand on the back of the baby's neck um, and head that has been shown um, in 2016 to worsen nipple pain fourfold. It's still a very commonly used approach both by um, um, our, our, our midwives in hospital and, and also um, lactation consultants. So fit and hold problems have the following serious ramifications, again, which would be familiar to you. So um, obviously um, the positional stability at the breast leads to the behavioural problems of fussing, pulling off, um, back arching, condition dialing up. The poor milk transfer, so poor satiety, um, which causes babies to cry even in the context of weight gains that have previously been um, viewed as adequate, actually. Um, excessive night waking, the, the, the excessive um, um, crying, um, which, which I mentioned. And then, of course, um, breastfeeding problems we know predispose um, women to anxiety and depression. So uh, in a paper that's actually just finally come out by um, myself and Associate Professor Donna Geddes, um, the chair of the Human Lactation Research Group at the University of Western Australia, we analyse all the ultrasound studies that have been done internationally with breastfeeding mother-baby pairs, many of course um, of which have come out of the Human Lactation Research Group. And we show that the biomechanical model upon which um, current approaches to um, latch and positioning fit and hold support are based and upon which the, the, the referrals for phrenotomy are being based in the absence of a classic tongue tie are wrong. It's painful um, for us to, to look at this and, 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 and here we are just on the cusp of this paradigm shift and we're needing to go over into a new model. So in this um, um, paper, um, Donna and I um, propose uh, that out of what we're seeing in the ultrasound studies, um, a new gestalt model um, accurately describes what's happening when our um, bubbies are, are suckling at the breast. Um, and uh, it's out of this that um, we've developed um, what we're calling gestalt breastfeeding. Um, which is a new approach to fit and hold, although it builds on um, the foundational work by our, um, our previous uh, breastfeeding um, support pioneers. Um, so actually, I am hearing it said that, that what we're doing in Gestalt breastfeeding is um, just what any um, good lactation consultant would do. 
And that's actually not the case. It's not the case at all. Um, so if you go closely into the work, um, that becomes apparent. And, and the way to, to kind of assess this is by the outcomes. If a baby is being diagnosed with reflux, if a baby is being referred off for phrenotomies in the absence of a severe classic tongue tie, then gestalt breastfeeding is not being applied. Um, so for those of you who have an interest in, in um, really becoming immersed in this work around a clinical breastfeeding support, um, the accreditation that we're offering in Melbourne um, uh, may be of interest to you. And all of this work is, is um, up on our website now. We're, we're still at, not quite launched, but nearly there. Do you have questions about this? Does it make sense to you? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think that, um, I think that people see Tom Ty as a miracle cure and that I think people sometimes invest in a tongue tie and everything will be okay at that when it is actually the breastfeeding support that's, that's yes. what yeah. I feel like. Yes, yes, that's right. And similarly with the pharmaceuticals, the proton pump inhibitors for unsettled behaviour. And naturally, you know, naturally parents hope for a quick fix. We know, there's research to show that if um, the health professional intimates that there may be any kind of reflux at all, um, then those families are much more likely to want to. You know, they'll pressure the health professional for a for a proton pump inhibitor. Not because they're crazy, but because if there's any hope of making the situation um, improve, then they'll, they'll naturally want to try it. Um, so the onus is on us as health professionals to be very careful about how we um, use language and um, make sense of baby's cues as we're talking with parents. So bottle feeding is a subset of the domain of breastfeeding, isn't it? Because whether there's express breast milk or formula in that bottle, actually we're wanting to emulate um, the biological norm of breastfeeding just as closely as we can. Um, the, the cues in bottle feeding um, that are typically misinterpreted are much the same. So the back arching, the fussing at the bottle, it's typically diagnosed as reflux but generally relates to positional instability. Um, can relate actually to the pressure that's placed on feeds that are being spaced out and the parental concern to actually get that milk in and use a little, um, you know, little coercion to do so. And then of course we do see the condition dialing up of the sympathetic nervous system with the bottle as well. Cry fuss problems. The latest um, systematic review of crying durations which I've been sweating on for a long time because I first heard this reported back in 2011 and I've been citing it over the years, but they finally uh, got round this team, to, uh, Dieter Volker's team, um, to, to publishing it. And uh, what it shows actually is that the um, normal crying curve that we're all taught is um, outdated, that our little ones cry on average for two hours a day from birth over the first six weeks in the West. Um, but what's significant is that these crying durations are modifiable according to culturally determined infant care practices even within the West. And certainly in our own preliminary study using the five domain um, uh, approach to unsettled infant behaviour, um, we showed a halving of crying and fussing um, in babies, in, in, in newborns. Parents, of course, and particularly mothers, are hardwired to feel distress if their baby cries. Um, and yet, typically in our world, they're asked to endure. They're, 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 the, the, the crying is normalised. And I think we can look parents in the eye and say um, it's normal for babies to cry a lot in the first 16 weeks or so and it passes but as health professionals there's a lot that we need to be doing um, to actually support those parents to stay on the bike and and keep that dial 
um, turn down on the sympathetic nervous system of the baby as best we can. Do you have a sense, maybe I'll just ask you, what you think the most um, significant unidentified underlying problems are uh, when babies are, are crying and fussing a lot? How do you make sense of that? Does anyone want to offer something? Well, I'll tell you how I make sense of it. <laughs> so, um, hunger for milk. And this, as, as I say, is in the context of what's previously been viewed as, as normal weight gains. Because in fact, again, as I think you'd be aware, the WHO cohorts um, show us that breastfed babies are gaining more like 200 to 250 grams a week um, in the first months of life. Um, whereas typically we've said 125 grams a week is, is adequate. Um, positional instability at the breast. The hunger for richer sensory nourishment. So I'm often saying to parents it's not well understood um, because you'll get all the messages not to let your baby get overstimulated or overtired. We don't use that language at all because by far the greater risk, I'll say to parents, is that our little ones just aren't receiving a rich enough sensory diet. All the research tells us that lovely rich sensory input um, uh, also optimises developmental outcomes. And our babies cry inside our homes just because our interior environments are low sensory. Though the little people here today seem to be doing really well so far, so. <laughs> what was that, sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but they're very welcome, regardless of what they wish to communicate to us. <laughs> and then, of course, um, conditioned sympathetic nervous system hyperarousal, um, often not picked up, not understood, but um, is, is um, typically what happens when you've got babies who are crying and fussing a lot in the first 16 weeks. So just to mention that I've aimed to make this work um, accessible to both parents and health professionals in a case-based way in the Discontented Little Baby book. So then that third key domain of sleep. Um, so sleep training is a very widespread cause of communication confusion between parents and babies. Sleep training is a common reason for parents and their bubs to completely fall off that bike. The dominant um, sleep approaches are based on first wave behavioural principles. Are you all comfortable with that term or do you want me to unpack it a bit? Yep. So um, first wave behavioural approaches to, to um, infant care arose in the 50s and 60s and uh, are very dominant still in, in um, health professional approach approaches to sleep today. So I'll often run through with parents what sleep training or first wave behavioural approaches look like and they're nodding because these are the messages they're getting from, from, you know, from the first days um, after their baby's birth. You've got to teach the little one to self-settle or you'll be setting up bad habits and indeed um, your baby won't reach their full um, intellectual potential down the track. <coughs> Um, sleep breeds sleep, so you've, you, you shouldn't let the baby be awake for more than such and such a time during the day and then get good big blocks of sleep during the day, link up those second sleep cycles. Um, uh, get the baby down really early at night, you know, 6pm, 6, 6 never later than 7pm. Um, don't let the baby develop um, negative associations um, with sleep like breastfeeding off to sleep or indeed bottle feeding off to sleep because that's going to set up a bad habit so use feed play sleep cycles um, and uh, I think I've already mentioned don't let the baby get overtired or overstimulated so is that package familiar to you yeah. this is what our families are hearing um, uh, right from the beginning around sleep but of course, um, these first wave behavioural approaches are directly teaching parents to ignore or override powerful biological cues like 
falling asleep with a breastfeed. And of course, they're giving parents prescriptive, prescriptive lists of cues so they're teaching parents how they should be making sense of their baby's communications. Um, instead of allowing parents to experiment over time, which we know is how they develop that relationship with the baby. So they might be told that a yawn or the rubbing of the eyes is, is a tired sign and you've got to immediately get that baby down to sleep. Um, or starting to grizzle, tired sign, uh, first tired sign, get the baby down. Um, in fact, that little one might be signalling that they need a change of sensory environment, for instance. So you can see that first wave behavioural approaches um, uh, are really belonging to an old paradigm and really I trust that um, it won't be too many more years be before, before we actually move over um, into something uh, closer to what we're doing actually in um, the Possum's Sleep Program. Professor, Professor Helen Ball, Ball who's um, uh, really the, the world's leading infant sleep researcher came out to do a sabbatical with us last year because it's her view that we're the only genuine alternative internationally and we're now collaborating with Helen um, and her sleep laboratory um, at Durham University in the UK. Um, you'll notice though that um, the, the traditional sleep training approaches are now being wrapped in the language of responsive care or cued care as an acknowledgement of all that literature that shows that cued care is, is in fact what optimises our, our children's um, uh, development. Um, so something like responsive settling for instance is a euphemism that's used in first wave behavioural approaches that's very confusing to parents. I think the ramifications of really doing this paradigm shift and taking on board um, how sleep training disrupts um, parent-infant um, synchrony um, is, is so immense um, that um, uh, the costs involved um, are a disincentive for government policy makers because actually sleep training is the, the state-sponsored approach to parent-baby care in Australia at this time. Do you have thoughts about this? No? Do you agree this is a serious problem? Thank you. So the fourth domain, mood. We know anxiety predisposes to depression. Many factors that predispose to postnatal depression can't be modified, such as uh, biological uh, predisposition, past history of depression, or indeed antenatal depression. But there are key modifiable causes of postnatal depression and, and I argue very strongly that because they are modifiable they should be an absolute health system priority. So anxiety which predisposes to depression is induced when multiple health professionals give parents conflicting advice. Cry fuss problems which we know are modifiable according to infant care strategies increase the risk of postnatal depression. Sleep problems, which are currently dealt with by approaches that, that uh, worsen communication confusion, increase the risk of postnatal depression. And breastfeeding problems, um, which can be dealt with if we start to work with our new understandings around the biomechanical models of infant suck, increase the risk of postnatal depression. So you can see that um, um, from my point of view, we, we um, live in very interesting times. What's that, sorry, Nikki? I think it's, it's painful to say, but we have iatrogenic communication confusion. Our advice is is um, inducing anxiety and that actually puts women at risk. So high level evidence tells us that um, cognitive behavioural therapy and interpersonal therapy are effective treatments for postnatal depression. They're the two that have been extensively investigated. Um, 
Now, in our neuroprotective developmental care programs, we integrate acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a contemporary form of cognitive behavioural therapy, feeling that important respects, it's more effective than traditional uh, CBT in the perinatal period. Um, we know that um, um, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, effectively targets rumination and this is one of the ways in the evidence that it's perhaps proving to be more effective than CBT, although the evidence base is still being built up for acceptance and commitment therapy. Women are hardwired to be anxious in the post-birth period. From an evolutionary point of view, this is protective and this will predispose to rumination, which predisposes to depression. Traditional CBT, by disputing ruminative thoughts, can worsen rumination, whereas ACT strategies promote diffusion from rumination, uh, which is in fact the more effective way to go. So this becomes another way in which we as health professionals can unwittingly worsen women's symptoms, being afraid of anxious feelings, sad thoughts, lack of motivation and depression worsens these same symptoms. So you might remember Sylvia Plath's um, a beautiful poem, The Mirror, which was written shortly before she died. The moon mother is not sweet Mary. Her blue robes unloose small bats and owls. So in the language of this remarkable poet, we live in a world that has unrealistic images of what it is to be a mother, the Mary in her pristine blue robes. If we accidentally communicate to her that those small bats and owls actually place her and her baby at risk, then she'll do whatever she can to get rid of them. But by paying attention to those small bats and owls as she tries so desperately to get rid of them, they will multiply. In acceptance and commitment therapy, this is called turning on the struggle switch psychologically. If we give her sets of strategies, if we communicate to her that it's normal to find small bats and owls slipping out from under your robes as you walk through the perinatal period, and if we give her simple sets of strategies that teach her how to continue to walk in a way that's aligned with her values along her chosen path, bringing her attention back from those small bats and owls onto the journey that she's taking, then we empower her. This helps her switch off the struggle switch. And these are some simple strategies that can be easily tucked into our consultations at the coalface. So I'm not for a moment suggesting that, that we don't need our capacity for appropriate screening and diagnosis and management concerning postnatal depression, anxiety, or indeed other um, mental health challenges in the perinatal period. But we do need to be very careful that we're not giving messages that disempower new parents and that actually worsen women's mental health in this vulnerable period because this is easily done. So there is a crisis in the care of new families across the domains of breastfeeding, crying, fussing, sleep and mood. You know, we can send a robot to land on Mars or more recently, Elon Musk can send a, a, Telstra, a Tesla, Tesla Roadster into space in the direction of Mars. You know, we have breathtaking nanotechnologies. We live in extraordinary technological times. We can transplant human hearts and human bladders. But we actually can't help those parents get back on the bike. We um, promote um, misinterpretations of those babies' um, signals and communications in ways that result in iatrogenic communication confusion. And this I believe is appalling. One of the most common things that parents I work with um, will say is that this just makes sense. So whether it's as we're working with the breastfeeding, whether it's with, with the cry fuss problems, the sleep, or indeed um, 
some uh, low intensity act strategies for, for um, emotional well-being. These strategies that, that we use repair the complicated disruptions that occur in our socio-cultural context and free up a woman's intuition to get back on the bike, to get on with her job, which is growing joy in early life, is it not? So thank you. Um, I'd like to invite um, questions or feedback in the time I've got left. I believe there's, there's some time, uh, maybe 10 minutes for a discussion, if you want. Last slide, just to remind you of, um, of um, the certification, accreditation, and also the PIPs. What would you recommend in Simon's case? With Simon? Yes. So everybody's recommended all these things regarding frenulum and PPI. What, yes. What do you see so, from? thank you. So we work with a five domain approach to what, um, let's say I'm coming in at week five um, and this, you know, would be a typical presentation. Um, Jane may have seen uh, literally um, four or five lactation consultants and, and multiple other health professionals. So um, we use a five domain approach. In fact, often I'll use a visual tool, um, which is um, a skill set that, that we talk about in the certification and accreditation. So we have to work across um, the neurobehavioral domains of feeds, breastfeeding, um, sensory sleep, baby's health and um, um, mother's uh, emotional health. So critically here, we would be, because Jane's clearly so committed to breastfeeding, and, and I mean, this is, this is the heroism in early life care, isn't it? What, what women um, do to, to continue to breastfeed their babies. It just constantly moves me. So um, our very first place would be to, to look at um, the positional instability that's been the underlying problem right from the beginning. And, um, and generally, um, we get very good outcomes very quickly with that using the gestalt breastfeeding. Um, things become more complex when that little person has developed a conditioned dialing up at the breast. So then we move through a whole set of strategies for managing conditioned dialing up at the breast. In, in essence, um, never persisting. We've got to optimise the underlying positional stability, critical, but then never persisting when it's not coming together um, and then coming back a little bit later on um, to try again so that we're not perpetuating um, distressed experiences at the breast for that baby, not to mention the mother. Um, so this then brings us into making sense of um, um, uh, burping or not burping, so we'd certainly abandon all of that incredibly disruptive burping behaviour. Um, but that needs, needs to accompany some good explanations because um, you know, at the moment the concept of swallowing air, it's a serious misconception. It has no basis in evidence, um, but it's, it's very widespread. So, so neurohormonal disruptions occurring um, in our breastfeeding families because of the concept of You've got to burp the baby, you've got to hold the baby up right after feed. So you can see how that interferes actually with sleep um, and just makes life harder than it needs to be. Um, so all of these multiple approaches, it actually becomes quite a complex consultation, often can require a couple of consultations. Um, uh, I, I, I probably wouldn't address um, the oral tie issue because um, that's, that, that's water under the bridge. Um, so um, typically what I hear from families in the absence of a classic tongue tie is yep it worked fantastic you know he went straight back onto the breast and um, but then a week later his reflux was getting worse and worse at the breast um, or a week later, he seemed to be swallowing so much air. So, you, 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 because parents are spending perhaps a thousand dollars or more um, on this, and are surrounded by uh, chiropractors and dentists and lactation consultants who are very deeply invested in this 
this being effective. We know there's a measurable neurobiological effect of expectations. Um, so I would say it's really clear in my practice, really clear that it doesn't improve outcomes. I mean, they're turning up to see me, you know, after um, the treatments. Um, or they're coming up for a second opinion and it's before they go to treatments and it's just so clear that the problem is to do with fit and hold and we work on that. Um, and there's usually some kind of normal variant of oral connective tissue visible in the mouth and, and we get good outcomes. So, um, so Jane and Simon, um, if he'd come to see me, he was on the PPI, I probably wouldn't have addressed that either. But we address all these underlying ways um, that, that Jane has been told to make sense of her baby's behaviour and we offer a different way of making sense of Simon's communications. And, um, and again, in my clinical experience, there's, there's typically enormous relief. And, uh, you know, it involves things like um, explaining to parents that when things feel so out of control with breastfeeding, then naturally you think, oh, I've just got to space out the feeds. I just can't keep doing this. You know, there might be the marathon feeding, the excessive feeding or, or indeed all this fussing at the breast. So it's natural, it's understandable that parents want to space out feeds. But I say, you know, if we can get that breastfeeding working for you, if we can get it so that little Simon's dial down, it's really, it's enjoyable, it's working, then we've got this terrific tool really to help us make the days as relaxed and as easy as possible, just using the breast frequently and, uh, and flexibly whenever it's convenient to dial the baby down. So I could, you know, talk endlessly about how we do manage those kinds of um, presentations, but I see Stephen's there. I think it's probably just about time for me to move on. Is that right? It's just about time. One more question, if someone has one more question. Then I guess it's time to move on, but don't you go Thank anywhere. Thank you. Yeah, because I need to call up one of the mid midwives first to say thank you very much. Oh. And I would like to call for a round of applause. <laughs> Molly. Thank you, Pamela. It's I'm my pleasure. First. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Interesting. Thanks, Molly. No worries.